I am currently on a plane flying from the UK to Munich in Germany, where I am scheduled to interview this man. I find it very interesting that this sort of information is is in the uh, ancient scriptures of the Holy Quran, and uh, I have no way of of knowing where they would come from. But uh, I think it is extremely interesting that they are there and that this work is going on to discover uh, the meaning of some of the passages. Now, allegedly at some point he was asked, what do you think is the origin of the text in the Quran? To which apparently he's supposed to have replied. Well, I would think it must be the divine being. Now this is going to be interesting. Right, the first thing I would like you to do, if you wouldn't mind, would be to tell the people watching what your name is, please. William W. Hay. Now, are you the William W. Hay who appeared in the video I'm about to show you now? I find it very interesting. Yes, that's me, and that was in Islamabad in 1984, I believe. Right. Let's see. Um, well, that was the answer to my next question. When and where was this <laughs> video? So you, we're saving on time. <laughs> right then. Um, can you tell me um, what were you told was the purpose of this event? Well, the uh, there were two events. I met with um, Sheikh Zindani in Jeddah in, I believe it was 1983. And uh, that was uh, an invitation that had been extended because uh, the, we had heard that the Saudis were trying to do things that would make it easier for scientists to pursue their research in the Arab countries without interference from the mullahs. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I was approached by the Geological Society of America uh, to see whether I might be willing to participate in this. And I guess I was the first American to be chosen to, to go to Saudi Arabia. So uh, I was uh, a little concerned about what this was about because I don't know much about religion and uh, my specialties are in geology and marine geology and, and uh, paleo-oceanography and paleoclimate. And, uh, but I was visited by uh, two gentlemen, a, uh, a Mr. Ahmed and a Mr. Mansour, who talked to me about visiting Sheikh Zindani, and uh, I agreed to do it. Mm -hmm. I had understood that uh, this was a program that was going to help to make it easier for scientists in the, in the uh, uh, Muslim world to do their work. Right, okay. Um, uh, can you describe um, what happened upon your arrival? The first event was Jeddah, did you say? That's right. So could you describe what happened when you arrived at Jeddah? Well, I arrived at Jeddah and was taken to a hotel, the Meridian, and uh, then for about four days, each day I would visit Sheikh Zindani, and we would have a discussion about different topics that he was interested in. Very, very, a very pleasant man to talk to and so on. Um, and... Um, and he felt that there were certain passages in the Quran that were not readily explained except in terms of modern science. Mm -hmm. So I was curious to learn about those and yep. we had good conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, toward the end, we settled on one topic that uh, they wanted me to talk about, which was about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, internal waves in the ocean. Well, this is a pretty esoteric topic and I was really curious as to how there could be anything in the Quran about it. Uh, but actually, there is knowledge of these that goes back a long, long way. The Vikings knew about them and so on. Uh, we, I, I was 
asking whether uh, Mohammed had ever been to sea or had been talking to sailors, and I was assured that he had never even seen the sea and never talked to sailors, and uh, he was illiterate and would not have had any knowledge about these sorts of things. So I said, well, you know, if, if, if there were no possibility that he had ever heard any of this or this or this or this, uh, then I, I uh, made the statement, well, then you could say it was uh, information from a divine being, but that would require a lot of proof. You yeah. know, you would have to, you would have to be sure that none of these other things had happened and that what didn't seem to be evidence that, that one could uh, exclude them from having happened. So when you were saying, um, so I noticed the thing with the, the interview that's been distributed, um, you're saying that the information in the text presented to you was quite interesting and that it's, um, it's good that they're trying to work out the origins of this text. And then the video cuts immediately to a new scene where you say it must be from the divine being. Um, now, the account that I've got, um, there's one here, which is um, a Quran which has got um, claims for scientific miracles in and you're listed in the back and it says for that part um, and when he was asked about the source of the Quran he replied well I would think it must be the divine being so are you saying that that is a misrepresentation? That's a misrepresentation okay uh, there's no question about that at the meeting and now that was I think those quotes are all, or the, the video is from the meeting in Islamabad, which was a year later, which was a larger conference. Mm -hmm. um, at the meeting in Jeddah, we had a final session uh, that was filmed out on a boat. And uh, again, the sheik went through his list of things and I explained all the, my, the, the things that I thought might not be true. Yeah. That, um, uh, things that Muhammad might have known, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And he said, but if we exclude all of those, all of those, then what is then? What is the conclusion? Well, then I said, well, then you could conclude it could have come from a divine being. Yeah. What came after that is, of course, recorded, and that is my, probably, I think I made a statement, but I don't think that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> So effectively what he'd done was to say, um, look at this information, you'd presented lots of various ways that he could have known it um, through purely natural means, and he said, well, what if he'd never did this? What if this isn't true? What if this isn't true? Painted a purely hypothetical situation, right. and you said, well, under those condi conditions, it must have been from the divine being, but I don't think so. That's right. And then the, set, yeah. the middle was cut out, and then, of course, the fake... So yeah. the fake question was presented. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I, I realized this had gone on for about four days preparing me for this yeah. and and uh, to get to the point where one would finally say those words that he wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. So he was a very clever person. Um, let's see. So that was the follow-up visit to Islamabad. Um, you you said, said to me earlier before we started recording that took place on a boat. Was the this was in Jeddah. Jeddah was the boat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now the conference in Islamabad, uh, I think the the video is from the conference in Islamabad. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there were a number of people present. Uh, it was a it was a meeting with several hundred people present, conducted in the uh, in the building, the Parliament Building of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, we had a panel discussion. Yeah. And that's what the the video is from. And what I emphasized there was that it's interesting that these things might be in a religious text, but I didn't know why they would be there. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest problem with them is interpretation, because I think the sheik was reading into them all sorts of modern interpretations, which weren't necessarily original. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I should say that I think uh, a problem in this whole area is that the meanings of the words, while the words themselves are preserved in script, mm -hmm. the meanings of the words may not be the same today as they were yeah. in the year 700. Mm -hmm. 
that happens in all other languages. I don't know why Arabic would be any different, that yep. meanings of words don't change with time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's the, probably the biggest problem in the whole thing yeah. is that the words don't mean the, the way the sheikh is interpreting the words, yeah. which seems to be his unique way of interpreting the words, is not the same as what the original words meant. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's uh, various exegesis on the Quran from different centuries where these miracles are never told. We not had these miracles described to us in advance of the scientific discovery, but then when the scientific discovery is made, people look back and say, oh, look what the Quran clearly said all along. Um, um, yeah. The, the, the these most of them are things that I would think that if if God wanted somebody to make a great revelation, these are not the things <laughs> I would have expected. Yeah. To, what, what, yeah. what because they're all readily observed. What specifically was was the one specific miracle claim that Zindani wanted you to look at? This is about internal waves in the ocean. Yeah. And he interpreted it with a very modern interpretation. I think if, you know, when I look at the English translation, that what may have been intended was uh, uh, to, to talk about the glitter, what we call glitter, which is the, the light that you see on the sea floor that's uh, uh, formed by waves, and then they focus in it, the light in a different way. And what you see on the sea floor looks like something very different from what you see on the surface. Mm -hmm. That would be an alternative interpretation of, of what the words might mean. Yeah. Um, but I would think that anybody who had been to sea, and the Arabs had an enormous thousand-year history of, of seamanship, uh, would have had a lot of knowledge about these sorts of things. You gave an example to me earlier before we started filming about um, uh, one place where two seats and seas are meeting where people would have fished. Oh, yes, certainly in the Bosporus, yep. yes. And that's where two seas meet, the Black Sea and the Sea of Marmara. The waters flow out from the Black Sea, and uh, below the outflow is an inflow into the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. And this has been known forever, because when fishing boats go there, the fishing boats uh, would normally drift toward the um, uh, Sea of Marmara with the outflowing water. But when they lower the nets to the bottom, the fishing boats are dragged backwards mm -hmm. in the other direction toward the Black Sea. Yeah. So uh, I think everybody for a long time has realized that there are two sets of waters there, one yep. flowing out, one flowing in, and going in the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, any any fisherman would have certainly known that. Yeah. And we, what kind of, I mean, we're talking, if they've been fishing for a very long time, which they clearly had, then, you know, this this could easily be available knowledge to someone couldn't it oh it would have been it would have been common knowledge to those people and i think it would have gone to uh others there's also a possibility i don't know about the details uh but uh fishermen in the straits of bab el mendab mm -hmm. probably experienced the same thing yeah there is an uh inflow at the surface into the red sea and an outflow at depth mm -hmm. so the there would have been the same sort of thing very close to Jeddah. Yeah, uh, that would have been noticeable, I think, to any any fisherman who used nets to get to the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Now, in light of your previous questions, um, I'll ask the next next question somewhat in jest. Did you become a Muslim? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the uh, the final questions um, are really just to. Uh, to clear up any accusations which I foresee coming my way when I make this video public. Um, first thing I would like to ask you is, are you being paid by anyone at all to do this video? No, no, no. In fact, you bought my lunch, so thank you very much. <laughs> yes, he bought better. my lunch, so I'm, I'm not paying him. Um, have you been intimidated in any way to retract your original statement? Not by me or anyone? No. 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 Okay. No Freemasons. No. No, Jews, no, no, no. No. No one. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to ask you, what do you think was the real purpose of this event? Well, as I say, we thought it was to mm -hmm. help make it easier for scientists to operate in the Muslim world. Yeah. But clearly, I think in retrospect, it is uh, to try to recruit people for uh, the Muslim for Islam.
Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to say it, but under false pretenses. Yeah. And yeah. that's a really serious problem. And finally, um, at some point previously, you mentioned um, um, an event with your hosts. I think it was in Islamabad, a meal after after the show. Could you oh, could you tell 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 me about that? <laughs> yes. Well, we had a we had a um, one of the meals after one of the evenings in the conference. One of the afternoons in the conference, we had an evening meal, and I was seated with a um, table. These were all the all the the representatives from who were there, except for the the uh, Westerners, uh, were religious figures in the Muslim world. And I was seated with one group. They all seemed to know each other. And and Pete Palmer, who was with me, he asked the question, uh, why are there no women here? And we were given the interesting answer that, well, women can't be here because women don't belong in this religious group. Women have no souls. <laughs> And uh, we were both rather stunned by that. Mm -hmm. And then, I guess in retrospect now, we realized yeah. that that was a table of Taliban. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was a very, very interesting experience. And I know that's not, a, not a, necessarily a very widely held view yeah. in, the, in the Muslim world, especially by women. Yeah. Uh, but um, that was what we were told. Right. Lovely. Thank you very much for doing this interview. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I thank you for, very much. Thanks.